All right, let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. My name is Hamara Osman, and on behalf of Muscular Dystrophy Canada, I'm very happy to welcome you to our second day from our Neuromuscular Virtual Conference. Before I go ahead and start to introduce the topic for today, I would like to mention that today's webinar is available in both English and in French. There is a globe icon on your screen in which you can access today's audio in English and French. I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Uh, uh, Marie Helene Bolduc. She's the director of mission at MDC, and she'll share the instructions as well in French. Oui, alors ben, bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'être là aujourd'hui pour cette deuxième journée de notre colloque. Euh, je voudrais vous informer pour les personnes qui veulent entendre la, la présentation en français. Si vous regardez sur l'image qu'on voit à l'écran, il y a une icône en forme de globe terrestre. Si vous cliquez sur cette icône-là, vous pourrez aller sélectionner euh, la langue euh, de votre choix, le français, et tout ce qui sera dit, euh, que ce soit en anglais ou en français, vous allez entendre dans, euh, euh, en français. Alors, merci et bonne euh, conférence. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, all right, so since April 2020, when we launched our Let's Talk NMD, Let's Talk Neuromuscular Disorder series, one of the most common suggestions that, uh, that was uh, appearing in our feedback surveys was around pregnancy and neuromuscular disorders. And so we're really ecstatic to talk about this today and to have Dr. Erin O'Farrell and Dr. Andrea Parks here to discuss this topic. Dr. O'Farrell is a, a neuromuscular specialist and an assistant professor at McGill University. She contributes widely to also the CNDR, which is the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry. Dr. Andrea Parks is a neurologist and a currently a fellow training in neuromuscular disease in Toronto at Sunnybrook Health Sciences. She recently contributed to a chapter on NMDs and pregnancy. Again, we're super thankful for their time and the time they took to prepare the presentation on um, NMDs and pregnancy. I'll go ahead and stop sharing, Dr. O'Farrell, so you can share your presentation. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here and uh, to talk to you about this today. Um, just give me a minute. So you should be able to see my first slide. Let me know if, uh, if not. Looks great. All right, so uh, my name is Erin O'Farrell. I'm uh, from McGill University and I work mainly at the Montreal Neurologic Institute. And I'm gonna talk today about pregnancy and neuromuscular disorders. And I'm gonna start off the talk and Andrea's gonna join a little bit uh, later. So just to give you our disclosures, we have no relevant disclosures for this talk, but I do wanna disclose that I have um, participated in clinical trials either, either as principal investigator or sub-principal investigator and fu funded by the following companies. So we're gonna talk um, briefly uh, about a disclaimer I wanna give before, before giving you this talk. This is a very hot topic, but it's also a very sensitive topic and I wanna be kind of cognizant of that. And we're going to do a little warm up poll to uh, start it off a little bit interactive. Then I'm going to go over an introduction to neuromuscular disease and general factors to consider before, during, and after pregnancy, things that are sort of more general to most neuromuscular disorder disorders. And then we're going to get specific. So we're going to divide up the diseases you see listed below and talk more specifically about issues that might come up with each of them. At the end, we'll have some conclusions and then a question answer period. So I wanted to have a little disclaimer before we get started because this is a, a difficult topic and highly charged topic. And you know, the decision to have children to get pregnant is something very personal. So this, this presentation is definitely not meant to substitute for, for medical advice and individualized advice and care is actually much more important than, than anything I could say in a presentation. So it's important that you, you keep that in mind, especially because of the complexity of care. So a lot of things we're gonna talk about are sort of general statements, but might not apply to each case individually. So it's really important that if you're thinking of pregnancy, see your own doctors who know you best. And although we are gonna discuss a, a lot about the risks and the dangers, um, because I'm a doctor, it's by nature to be vigilant for complications and to focus on them. But keep in mind, there's many successful pregnancies um, 
Uh, and many people who even have infants and children before their condition is diagnosed and things may go well. So although we have to talk about the risk because this is you know, a medical talk, uh, keep that in mind that we probably focus on it more than, um, more than the actual risk. So let's go to the first poll. So I have three COVID jokes. And I want you to tell me which ones you like the best. So the first one is um, uh, the Olympic Games. So notice the rings are safely distanced. And I'll let you um, read this one here. And the third one is about couch potatoes. So the health alert is that being a couch potato can actually cure COVID-19. So A is the Olympic Games, B is the quarantines, and C is the couch potatoes. Please go ahead and uh, make your choice. Mira, I see that I can't actually choose on mine. Is it? Uh, oh, yeah, I can. Yep, looks great. I'm going to go ahead and okay. end poll and also share the results so everyone can see. The quarantines wins. That's great. That was my favorite too, actually. All right. So maybe a bit uh, more serious poll. So let's go to the second poll question. I'm trying to get an idea of who's in the audience today. So if you could tell me, oops, if you could tell me um, which represents you best out of the list here. All right, so we have about a, a third of people who actually have a, a neuromuscular disease. And then we have a, a pretty uh, good distribution of some physio and occupational therapy, nursing, and doctors as well as other um, allied health professionals. That's great. And then I was wondering why you decided to sign up for this talk and, and listen today. Were you just curious, thinking of becoming pregnant for the first time, already pregnant, or already had children, but thinking of having more children? Excellent. So a lot of a lot of just curious, but uh, seven percent already pregnant. That's great too. Good. So a final question before we get into the, the talk. So I'd like to know what kind of diagnosis uh, you have. So if you have one from the list, please choose it. Otherwise there's an option for other or no diagnosis at the bottom. Great. So there's a uh, quite a significant that don't have proportion that don't have diagnosis. That's interesting. Um, I guess the the largest group falls into the muscular dystrophy. That's great because I spent quite a bit of time uh, relatively talking about that. Um, some spinal muscular atrophy, Charcot-Marie tooth, and myasthenia patients as well. That's great. All right. Very good. So I think we have to start by, by acknowledging that neuromuscular diseases are rare conditions. So a rare disease is defined usually by um, one person in, in 2000. So if it's less frequent or equal to one in 2000 people, that's considered rare. And if you group all the rare diseases together, actually in general, rare diseases aren't that rare. So about one in 12 Canadians will be affected by a, a rare disease. So individually, not common, but as a group, actually it's a significant and important population that has rare disease. So just to give you kind of a, a benchmark, so the prevalence of some neuromuscular diseases are listed here. So myasthenia gravis and myositis, also referred to inflammatory myopathy, is roughly uh, similar prevalences. So somewhere between four, 14 and 40 or five and 22 per 100,000 people. And any muscular dystrophy is somewhere around 20 per 100,000 with the commonest being Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So that's by far uh, quite a bit more common than the others. Followed pretty closely by myotonic dystrophy. And then the others like FSHD or fasciostapulohumeral muscular dystrophy um, are less common. And then everything that's not listed would be even less common such as oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, limb girdle muscular dystrophies. 
So what are neuromuscular conditions? I think this audience is, is well aware of this. So in the neuromuscular world, we limit ourselves to diseases that are from the motor neuron, the nerve, which could be the motor or the sensory nerve, the neuromuscular junction, which is that connection between the muscle and the nerve and the muscle itself. So here I've listed the main conditions that we're going to uh, cover today. Of course, we can't cover all the neuromuscular conditions in this talk. So we've chose to include ones that are either more prevalent or ones that we have actually more evidence for um, complications in pregnancy. So general principles. So this was hard to come up with general principles because each neuromuscular condition is unique and does pose uh, specific challenges for pregnancy. And some aspects though are common to more than one neuromuscular condi condition. So I'm gonna talk about those now in the next three or four slides, and then we're gonna dive into the specific conditions. So to, to sort of organize this, I divided up. So there's things to know before getting pregnant, things to know and do during the pregnancy, and then around the time of delivery is kind of another category. So these are the questions that I think are, are important to patients that, that have neuromuscular disease during pregnancy. So the top two questions are really related to the neuromuscular disease itself. And the bottom two questions are, are more related to the pregnancy and the baby. So people will ask, you know, will I get weaker because I get pregnant? Will I get worse during the pregnancy? And will the disease that I have affect my baby while I'm pregnant? And then for the last two questions, it, the question is really, do I have a bigger risk of pregnancy complications than someone who doesn't have a neuromuscular disease? And same question for the baby. Is the baby more at risk of complications than someone who doesn't have a neuromuscular disease? So keep in mind, all the, the pregnancy complications we're going to talk about are ones that everyone has. So all patients who don't have neuromuscular conditions are at risk for pregnancy complications. And the question is really, is the risk a little bit higher or lower because of the neuromuscular disease? So I think this is the most important slide of my entire talk. So before you get pregnant as much as you can, plan ahead. And by ahead, I mean, ideally, probably a year, maybe a little bit more. So it's really important to see your family doctor and your neurologist and get really specific individualized information about your condition and your risk. Um, the reasons to plan ahead are because if you're on medications, they actually may need to be changed or altered before you get pregnant. If you have a genetic condition, you may want to consider genetic counseling. So I understand you're going to go into this a little bit more during a, a subsequent talk, so I won't go into it too much in depth, but I would say this is really, really important and, and has to be considered. Also keep in mind that in Canada, genetic counselors aren't available on every street corner. So sometimes there's a wait list. Um, so really think ahead and then make sure that you, you get access. Um, there's some other things that you have, the doctor has to think about when you do get pregnant. So some neuromuscular con conditions can affect the heart muscle or the lungs, and it may be necessary to do some baseline testing before the pregnancy to see where things are at. And then as for people who don't have neuromuscular conditions, it's really important to remember the Canada Health Guidelines as well. So there are guidelines, you can see the website there for preconception care, and these are good advice for patients with neuromuscular disease too. So they recommend taking a multivitamin, a folate, that's to prevent neurotube defects, which neuromuscular patients are at risk with, same as the general population. They recommend limiting alcohol and getting some um, at least small amounts of exercise. So now we're gonna go into the, the three stages. So preparing for the delivery, this is sort of um, the later on. So it's really important that during the pregnancy, very early in the pregnancy, that you start about thinking about assembling your multidisciplinary team. So usually the neurologist or the family doctor is the quarterback of this team, but the team can consist of a lot of people. You may wanna involve midwives, doulas, you may need um, physios, occupational health, health or uh, occupational therapy. Um, you may need different kinds of doctors. So maybe a, a high-risk obstetrician, maybe an anesthetist. Um, there's a lots of, lots of uh, people that might be involved in the care depending on your particular needs. And it's really important to, to make sure that your, your caregivers 
know something about your risk. So it's really hard for people with rare diseases because, you know, when you go to your family doctor, your family doctor might not know about your disease. They may have developed a relationship with you and know you very well over the years, but they might not have a lot of other patients with your condition. So that's where your neurologist can come um, in into play and be helpful with um, explaining what people with your disease are, are at risk with during pregnancy. And I think it's important that there's a communication between the neurologist and whoever's delivering the baby, whether that'll be an obstetrician or, or a family physician. It's important to think a little bit more carefully about the, the delivery environment when you have a neuromuscular disease. If you are at high risk of, of complications or if the baby is, um, you might want to consider delivering somewhere where anesthetists and a neonatal ICU um, are available. Even if it's a low risk, you'll need those services. It's really um, reassuring to have them available quickly. And it is possible, like anyone who gets pregnant, that you for unexpected reasons have to go on to have a C-section. And for people with neuromuscular conditions, um, there can be some interaction with agents for anesthesia. So it's a good idea to have a, a pre-birth consultation with an anesthetist that can um, help, help with that a little bit. In general, so uh, for all neuromuscular conditions, it's usually better to have a regional anesthesia than a general anesthesia. So after delivery, these are some questions that come up. So some of the medications used for neuromuscular disorders, particularly the myasthenia and um, inflammatory myopathies, might not be great for breastfeeding. So that's something to discuss the risk benefits of with your, your doctors. And uh, some of the conditions can affect um, the disease. Some actually get better after delivery, but not, not all of them. So we'll talk a little bit about that specifically with the disorders. And um, being able to care for the baby is another concern that mothers have a lot. So um, of course, province by province, um, there's different supports for, for moms and families with uh, disabilities. Uh, here in Quebec, we have a, a very good program, Parents Plus. I believe they're talking uh, with, with uh, this conference next uh, tomorrow. Um, but it's important to think about the environment the baby and the mother will be in and is it properly adapted? Is there not only a caregiver to help relieve the mom, but also someone to help take care of the mom if, um, if you know, uh, uh, fatigue and energy or conservation are important. All these things require both financial and emotional supports as well. So it's good to plan in advance. And then um, will my baby have health problems? So that's something we'll consider specifically with each uh, condition. So we're gonna go specifically into the conditions right now. We're gonna start with um, um, Andrea. She's gonna talk about uh, Charcot Marie Tooth. So I'm going to mute myself at this point. Oops. Hi, can everyone hear me? You sound great. Is that a big yes? uh, perfect. Hi. So um, thanks again so much for inviting uh, me to be here. I'm really excited to talk about the, these topics as well. Um, so getting more into specific neuromuscular diseases. So charcot Mary tooth or hereditary motor sensory neuropathy is quite rare, but thought it was worth uh, mentioning just because there are certainly uh, people who, who have this and are in the childbearing age, and as we saw with the poll earlier today, um, it certainly does affect, affect people who may be thinking about pregnancy or just want to know more. Just very briefly, Charcot-Marie Tooth is a heterogeneous group of different neuropathies that are inherited. So um, there's multiple different causes, um, different genes um, or different combinations of genes can, can cause this, and it's a group of diseases that uh, generally affects either the, the myelin or the insulation of the nerves or the, the nerve itself. Uh, and this can vary for among individuals depending on, on the type. Uh, next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so there's actually, because it is quite a rare disease, there is very limited literature on this and I think it's important to keep that in mind that the numbers and, and the numbers from most of the conditions we'll be talking about are from generally the fairly small studies or retrospective studies that are done over a long period of time. So um, especially for, for something like CMT, the numbers vary quite widely and it's hard to, to get a good sense of exactly what the, uh, the risks may be. The other thing is that because some of these studies are, are older, you'll see um, 
the reviews are from, from more recently, but they're based on a lot of studies that were done in the 80s, 90s, or either case reports or just really small groups of patients, that also the, the treatment or what we know about the, these conditions has changed substantially as well. So the, the treatment or the management might also be improved uh, currently, which does uh, affect or might make these numbers a little bit skewed. So in general, the uh, few reports that there are in the literature about uh, pregnancy and CMT is about anywhere from 20 or 30 percent to 50 percent of people in these retrospective studies reported a worsening of their symptoms. It was usually either mild weakness, worsening of their weakness, or in their sensory symptoms. There's one study, it just had uh, 21 uh, patients in it who had CMT and gave birth. It found, it was interesting that those who had adult onset, uh, Charcot Mary 2, they had only been diagnosed in adulthood when they noted symptoms, actually had less of a risk uh, or didn't seem to be predisposed to develop an exacerbation versus those who'd had juvenile onset or possibly suggesting more severe disease um, were more likely to, to have symptoms worsening during pregnancy. They also have found that if you've had a pregnancy where you've had worsening of symptoms, this tends to predict that that will, could happen again uh, in a subsequent pregnancy. We'll see with other certain other neuromuscular diseases, this isn't necessarily true. Uh, and because this is a hereditary disorder and it's quite variable amongst individuals, uh, preconception genetic counseling is recommended because that's going to be unique to each individual and each individual pregnancy. In terms of the delivery uh, for patients who have CMT, uh, the studies that have been published show a similar rate of complications, about 1.9% in terms of um, birth abnormalities uh, that seem to the general population. So it's not felt that there's necessarily any increased risk to, to the baby during delivery. There is some question if there is potentially a increased risk of malpresentation. So that just means um, the baby eventually turns prior to delivery and is usually comes out head first and sometimes that fails to happen and there is some study that uh, studies that indicate that perhaps this happens a little bit more often in CMT. It's unclear if this is because of CMT in the mother or if because if, if this is indeed the case because it's a genetic uh, condition, it's possible that in the, the one study that found this, the, the babies were also affected. We don't know. And if the babies were affected, potentially they weren't moving quite as much. Uh, and they, you have to have quite a lot of movement as a, for the baby to be able to turn it by itself. So it's potentially could be related to that, but we're, we're unsure. Um, but there is potentially the higher need for, for instrumental delivery or for, for C-section because of that. The one other thing to just be mindful, and again, this is, this is far from proven, it's just been suggested in the literature that there may be also a higher risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Um, there's some thought that the nerves that uh, innervate the uterus and cause the uterus to contract can be affected by CMT. So after a delivery, the uterus needs to contract, contract down quite a lot to stop bleeding. And if that doesn't happen, there's a higher risk of bleeding. And there's some thought that that might be uh, something to, to just watch out for potential complication. Otherwise, generally people do can have normal uh, deliveries, normal vaginal deliveries. Um, and like Dr. O'Farrell has mentioned, uh, there is uh, consideration for uh, different anesthetics that we need to be careful with, in particular, uh, a certain kind of neuromuscular blocker that's used in um, by anesthetists uh, can be a higher risk in, in people with CMT. So again, that would be important to have an anesthesiologist involved. Uh, next slide. Just very briefly before moving on to myasthenia, so um, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy or the chronic form as well. So those are also neuropathies. So these are conditions that are acquired. They're not inherited so that people develop. And they're, they're similar in the sense that they're it's a, an autoimmune response or an inflammatory response against the, the nerve. And again, just like in CMT, this can be against either the insulation or the, the myelin of the nerve or the axon itself, or sometimes the junctions in between. Um, and there's also quite limited literature on this topic. So again, it's quite rare. Uh, 
there's possibly an increased risk of the acute form uh, or AIDP or sometimes referred to as Guillain-Barré in the first month postpartum. Otherwise, there's been no increased incidence found of it occurring during pregnancy. The rates are similar when they're age controlled to the general population. Uh, in terms of the chronic uh, inflammatory uh, neuropathy, there is potentially increased risk of relapses during pregnancy, especially in the, the last trimester or postpartum, probably to do with fluctuation in, in hormones. Um, from the case reports that there are of, of uh, women who have successfully delivered and carry pregnancies while being affected by either of these conditions, there didn't seem to be any effect on the fetus. Um, the reports of the, the mother having symptoms and being quite weak, but the baby not being affected at all. Uh, and treatment is the exact same. So the treatments of choice are IVIG and plasmapheresis in AIDP or Guillain-Barré. And there's one small study that looked at, at the treatment during pregnancy and found no complications associated with that. And then uh, for CIDP, it's similar with IVIG plasmapheresis and steroids. And again, those are treatments that are felt to be generally fairly safe in pregnancy. Perfect, so moving on to myasthenia. Uh, so just very briefly, as I'm sure most people here know, it's an, also an autoimmune disease. So it's generally acquired. Sometimes it can be inherited. There are certain forms uh, where there's antibodies against the, the receptors at the neuromuscular junction or the, the part where the nerve uh, communicates with the muscle and they become blocked by antibodies uh, against the receptor itself for proteins around the, the antibodies. Can go to the next slide. Uh, so that's just showing there that the, the antibodies block the, the neurotransmitters and um, if this connection gets blocked, then uh, people experience weakness, they can have trouble speaking, swallowing, have double vision because the, the muscles just aren't responding to, to the signals coming from the nerves. So there is, uh, you can go to the next slide, perfect. So we, there are some important implications for this because MG is two times more common in women than in men in the younger population. So in the young adult population with, in women, the most common time of onset is in the third decade, which is um, a time where a lot of people are contemplating pregnancy. Uh, MG itself has no impact on fertility, but there are certain medications that are sometimes used uh, that can. So that's an important thing to, to consider uh, when talking about both pregnancy and MG. And because of the, the onset being more common in women in their, their 20s, 30s, there's overlap expected with pregnancy. So it's something we need to, to certainly be aware of. So I think the, the most important thing, if you look at all of the guidelines, uh, the take home message is that an uneventful pregnancy is possible with MG with close monitoring of symptoms and optimization of treatment, both before and after. Uh, again, these numbers come from various studies and some of them are quite old, so the treatment parameters have changed significantly since they were published. But generally, about 40% can experience worsening, and this is usually initially in the first trimester or postpartum, and then about a third remain unchanged, a third actually improve in the second and third trimester, and this is probably from different uh, changes in the immune system related to tolerance and pregnancy. Exacerbations can occur, uh, regardless of the control prior to conception, there may be a slightly decreased risk with thymectomy. Uh, and because myosinic crisis tends to occur during the first two years after diagnosis, or tends to be a bit more common, some of the guidelines and some experts advocate for potentially if, that, if that's a worry to delaying pregnancy to after those first two years, uh, just to try to and avoid a additional factor that might promote an exacerbation. And long-term MG is not affected by pregnancy. So just very briefly, there's a bunch of physiological changes that happen in pregnancy uh, that have some implications. Most important being that if there's a lot of nausea and vomiting, then uh, you might not absorb the medication. So if you're taking medications by mouth, uh, they might not be fully absorbed or they might um, not be tolerated and that's important to, to be aware of and to also seek treatment for either of those symptoms quite rapidly with a, an obstetrician because certainly it's important that the, the medications are absorbed. The other 
important thing is that there's an increased risk of infections, especially UTIs, and those can trigger, um, like we know infections can be a trigger of worsening symptoms. So those need to be treated promptly. And um, it's important that the obstetrician or family doctor, whoever's treating is aware because there's certain antibiotics that are considered much safer or less risky to use. Uh, so those are the two big things that, that big changes in pregnancy that are um, have significant implications in myasthenia. The other thing is respiratory function can become compromised, especially near the end because of diaphragmatic restriction from the enlarging uterus. And so if respiratory symptoms are something that people have had or developed, it's important to do baseline pulmonary function testing and to, to monitor that quite closely. The other thing, and Dr. O'Farrell already alluded to this, is that pregnancy and parenthood also impose a lot of additional challenges after delivery. So um, for anyone, there's sleep and rest deprivation, and that can be significantly um, or significant stress on anyone, regardless of whether they have a health condition or not. There's also increased physical exertion related to childcare and increased stress. So all of those things can also uh, lead to potentially worsening of symptoms. And it's important to have more frequent monitoring, especially during the postpartum period and uh, adequate supports and uh, strategies for energy conservation to try and optimize uh, symptom management. So to look at the question, if the baby's at risk um, of complications from myasthenia, there is something called transient neonatal MG, and it's been reported to occur in 10 to 20%. It probably is actually on the lower side of those numbers. Uh, and it occurs when the antibodies from the mother transfer the across the placenta and affect the baby. So when the baby's born, they have some of these antibodies and have can have transient weakness initially. Eventually these antibodies are um, taken care of by the body, they don't last forever and the, the babies recover. And generally speaking, there isn't higher risk of autoimmune myasthenia in uh, babies born to mothers with myasthenia, but that's something that's really important to uh, be monitored for the baby to be monitored for. And it doesn't seem to uh, be based on the severity of the mother symptoms prior to, to birth. Um, in some rare cases, there can be a more severe uh, presentation of this if the antibodies are present against a, a certain type of or part of the, the receptor, but that, that's quite rare. Um, just to go through quickly, so to make sure Dr. O'Farrell has time to finish her slides. So there's no, the, the bottom line from all the studies that have been looked at, there's no statistically significant increased risk of uh, preterm birth, low weight, uh, spontaneous abortion, eclampsia, autoimmune myasthenia. So generally speaking, uh, aside from the possibility of transient neonatal myasthenia, the risk of complications is considered to, to not be any higher in terms of fetal outcomes. Special considerations for delivery, and we've already briefly talked about this, um, is that uh, the uh, mother might fatigue during the second phase of labor. So voluntary pushing requires striated or voluntary muscles. So sometimes uh, there, there is a risk for interventions or more interventions are needed like uh, um, uh, suction or forceps for delivery. MG itself is not an indication for C-section. Uh, and again, certainly in aesthetic agents, some uh, people with myasthenia are more sensitive or can be less sensitive to those agents. So that's important for the anesthesiologist to consider. And magnesium is something that's used uh, quite commonly in pregnancy, both as a laxative, but also used in a condition called eclampsia or preeclampsia. And magnesium actually blocks the neuromuscular junction and can precipitate weakness. So it's recommended that that be avoided and other alternatives be used. Lastly, just to briefly touch on medications, and this is quite specific again to each individual person. You'll see there it is a bit controversial. Generally, um, we consider methotrexate and mycophenolate, mofetil, or CELSEP um, to be contraindicated. Those medications have been shown to be associated with an increased risk of uh, 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 miscarriages as well as congenital uh, abnormalities. Uh, mestinon or pridostigmine, steroids, IVIG, and plasmapheresis are generally considered to be safe. Uh, and cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and azathioprine are 
controversial, just depending on some of the guidelines you read, there's some that favor them and say that they're they're quite safe and others that are a little bit more reluctant to use them. So that becomes a very personalized choice and uh, discussion uh, with for each individual patient. Rituximab is a fairly new medication, so we don't actually have um, enough data right now to know, know about its safety in pregnancy, but hopefully in the future we'll, we'll have a bit more information. Uh, similarly, for breastfeeding, uh, steroids um, and mestinone are considered safe. There's very little dose in the, the breast milk, um, and uh, there is a, some controversy surrounding is it the iprene cyclosporin. Some recommending to, to pump and dump if you're taking it, uh, but that again remains controversial depending on which guidelines you, you read. And lastly, uh, just before uh, Dr. O'Farrell uh, takes over again, um, contraception is an important thing to consider for in myasthenia. Uh, I think the most important thing here is that um, to just be aware that self-sept theoretically can reduce the hormones in OCP. So uh, theoretically, it could reduce its effectiveness. It's um, so just to be more careful with that. And it's generally recommended in myasthenia or with any immunosuppressant agent other than steroids, two reliable forms of contraception are used. So I'm going to um, thank Andrea. Thank, thank you, Dr. Parks. I'm going to take over. And I'm going to talk a couple about a couple of the other diseases. So let's start with inflammatory muscle disease. We put this one right after myasthenia because there's a lot of similar issues with the same um, medications used. They both affect women at reproductive age. Um, both are uh, relapsing diseases. So um, most of what was true for, for myasthenia can kind of been, on those topics anyway, can be extrapolated. So Inflammatory muscle disease is, is even more rare than, than myasthenia. So the, the studies are based on very small numbers of subjects and very retrospective uh, data. So in the category for before getting pe pregnant, it's important to look at the medication. But with inflammatory muscle disease, there's often comorbidities. So um, myositis can affect the lungs and give you interstitial lung disease. It can have cardiac involvement rarely and very often comes with other connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, just to name a few. So it's not just about managing the myositis before pregnancy, but also the other um, autoimmune diseases, if there are any. And it's generally thought now to be better to wait for a remission before um, starting a, a, or planning a pregnancy. So during pregnancy, um, the data is small, but actually some people improve. So maybe up, up to as high as 50%, uh, but can relapse afterwards. We think this is probably related to hormones, but no one knows for sure. And the drug recommendations are the same as uh, what Dr. Park said, so I won't repeat them. So there's, there's no definite information on fetal outcomes. In one study, they were found to be favorable. In another study, there was an increase in spontaneous abortions and preterm infants. But I think the numbers here are still too small to make any firm conclusions. The one thing that did kind of come out is that when they looked at um, one large US registry, um, this seems to be associated with hypertensive disorders. So um, this is where close to the time of delivery, um, women might have high blood pressure. So it's important to monitor blood pressure because these are things that we know how to treat and manage. And then some studies again say risk of relapse after, not so sure that that's conclusive. I'm going to talk about the muscular dystrophy. So I found this was the hardest topic to talk about when you want to talk about pregnancy because it's such a heterogeneous group of diseases. So really, I could spend a half an hour on each one of these diseases talking about the different studies related to pregnancy. Um, but that's impossible. So I'm going to try to make some general statements. So the, the studies I've decided or the diseases I've decided to focus on would be Duchenne and muscular dystrophy because this is the most um, common. And it presents with limb girdle weakness uh, shown in the picture here. Myotonic dystrophy is also common, especially in type one, not so much type two. So I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about it. We have a lot more data on myotonic dystrophy than some of the others. And then I'm also going to make, mention FSHD or fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy and a little bit less uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy forms. So 
these are genetic conditions. So the most important thing here is to have um, some thought before you get pregnant about genetic counseling and what the risks are. The only muscular dystrophy associated with fertility issues has been myotonic dystrophy because it can have effects on the endocrine system. Um, but it's not clear that that is, applies to everyone. So it's not universal. So weakness may or may not pro progress during the pregnancy. Of course, in the case reports, there's a little bit of bias of, of reporting cases where things get worse. Um, so I think that we, we don't know for sure whether it will progress or not, but we have to be prepared for that risk. And for the pregnancy complications, the best data we have is not from Duchenne or the other muscular dystrophies, but from myotonic dystrophies. And in a, a controlled study, there was an increased risk of ectopic pregnancies, premature deliveries, spontaneous abortion, stillbirths. However, these were still small risks, although they were bigger for, than the general population. Most can still expect to have a normal delivery. So the delivery um, may be by a spontaneous vaginal delivery as, as any um, woman delivers. However, it's recommended to be prepared for um, the possibility that a C-section might be required. So especially if the patient has baseline trouble with the respiratory or heart, um, a C-section could be required. And for muscular dystrophy, it's essential that the doctors know that certain anesthetic agents listed here um, can cause um, prolonged uh, weakness, sedation, rhabdomyolysis, and even the agents they used for induction and magnesium can sometimes uh, be reported to worsen weakness as well. So that's important to take home message. There was some theories that um, FSHD, which particularly causes abdominal weakness, may be related to um, failure to um, push during labor, but I don't think this has been um, definitively shown. Um, Patients, however, who are in wheelchairs need to have a good evaluation of the anatomy of the pelvis. And in some cases will be required to go to C-section for anatomical reasons. So there are, again, mostly data from uh, myotonic dystrophy that there is a little bit increased prolonged labor and delivery and also postpartum hemorrhage can occur. And of course the reactions to anesthesia, which can be uh, avoided. So after delivery, um, the best evidence we have is from DM1 and 2. There was no significant progression of weakness afterwards. And in fact, in one UK registry of FSHD patients, they actually found that the patients overall who had pregnancies progressed more slowly. Now, there were some problems with that study, so I, I'm not sure we can believe it 100% until it's replicated, but that was interesting. One important situation that you should be aware of is the risk of a congenital form of type 1 myotonic dystrophy. This is almost non-existent with DM2, but with DM1, if it's the mother who is affected with the DM1, there's a risk of having a very severe early onset in the next generation, so in the infant. This can lead to polyhydramnios, poor fetal movements, and an abnormal presentation. Preterm labor and delivery complications can occur, and the neonatal might need the intensive care um, care for eating and, and breathing problems. They also have a risk of joint contractures and foot deformities. So it's important to know about this um, in advance and have a, a delivery environment that's safe. So spinal muscular atrophy is the next disease I'm gonna talk about. And most of the data that we have in the literature is biased towards type three. So that's one of the milder forms. So before getting pregnant, uh, back to um, what I've said before, so genetic counseling is really important. And baseline respiratory evaluation may be indicated in patients with SMA, especially if they're um, wheelchair bound at the time they get pregnant. So there is unfortunately slightly higher preterm delivery and miscarriage rates. And there is some evidence for worsening of pulmonary function so that you have to be prepared for as well. So actually the fetal outcomes are pretty good. There was only a single report of, of babies with malformations. So that's it's probably coincidence. We have no way of knowing that that's related or not to the spinal muscular atrophy and only two babies with low birth weights. So in general, fetal outcomes in, in SMA are good. There are higher operative delivery rates. So closer to one third or a bit higher. And sometimes the patients, because they've had an operative delivery and are exposed to anesthetics, might have some respiratory muscle weakness, a bulbar dysfunction, um, and very rarely need ICU care, mostly for monitoring. So you have to be in a, a safe environment to deliver. So um, 
usually after the baby is delivered, any respiratory trouble that came on during pregnancy tends to improve. But sometimes there is some persistent worsening of, of motor symptoms that doesn't um, go away entirely. Now we are in a new age for spinal muscular atrophy since nusinersen became available for, for therapy and other therapies as well. And we just don't have any data on this yet to make any, any firm comments. So in conclusion, I think one of the, the biggest messages of our talk today is that you really need a multidisciplinary team. So that can include all the professionals uh, here. There's no one um, person who knows it all. Um, I'm a neurologist, but I fully admit I don't know much about pregnancy and deliveries and that kind of thing. So it's really important to work as a team and communicate with the other um, team members. We definitely need more research. So the evidence that I presented to you today are mostly based on small series, retrospective data. Dr. Parks did a good, um, good job of explaining also that these were done in the past and maybe don't reflect the better management that we have um, available today. So really because these are rare diseases that will require international cooperation, perhaps registries to accumulate sufficiently large patient numbers so that we get good information. And then there's also the issue of finding control groups in those situations as well. And it will always be difficult to make predictions about limb girdle muscular dystrophies because that's such a heterogeneous group with so many different genes involved. So I know we are, this is a medical talk and we focus a lot on complications, but please keep in mind the majority of patients can have children safely. Um, and some of these complications may be overstated because as doctors, we tend to report things to publish case reports when things go wrong, not necessarily when things go um, perfectly well. So keep that in mind as well. So we'd like to thank you so much for attending the talk today. Thanks to our patients who uh, without them, we wouldn't be here. And we'll ha we're happy to take French or English questions. Donc nous serons uh, contents de vous répondre aux questions en français. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you so much, Dr. Parks. That was excellent and exactly met our learning objectives for today, which was to get an idea of how um, in women with uh, different neuromuscular disorders do during pregnancy and after pregnancy and some great tips there. I'll pass it over to Marie Helen. I know she has uh, one question that came in through the chat box. Oui. Alors, la question est en français. Qu'arrive-t-il si la personne est porteuse du gène de la dystrophie musculaire de Duchenne et qu'elle veut devenir enceinte? C'est le cas de ma fille. Information supplémentaire, mon fils de 23 ans est atteint de dystrophie de Duchenne et je suis également porteuse. Donc, je dirais que c'est très important de parler à votre neurologue et aussi avec un conseiller en génétique. Donc, en principe, si vous êtes porteuse comme femme et vous devenez enceinte, Euh, L'enfant ou le bébé, si c'est une femme, normalement, elle n'est pas touchée par la maladie, mais peut également être porteuse. Plus de 50 % d'être porteuse aussi. Parfois, les femmes ont même plus tard dans la vie les symptômes. Si le bébé, donc si la mère est porteuse et tombe enceinte, si c'est un garçon, c'est euh, ça pourrait être touché par la maladie de, de Duchenne. C'est pas probable. Donc, c'est très important que vous voyez une, une conseillère en, en génétique pour discuter ces risques-là spécifiques à votre situation et les options. Est-ce que j'ai répondu bien à, à votre question? Je, je crois que oui. Ah, c'est déjà fait qu'on me dit oui. Donc, c'était en réponse à votre question. Okay. Vous avez répondu, merci. Dr. O'Farrell, a question we received um, prior to today's webinar was, and I believe you addressed it, was a uh, woman who is um, uh, receiving Spinraza, Nusi Nursen, and was wondering if there was any data at all that could help to inform whether there would be any complications throughout her pregnancy. Um, any comments on that further to what you uh, talked about today? Yes, yeah, so, so far there is no published data. But the um, company that provides the drug often keeps a registry, a voluntary registry or 
may have uh, post-marketing surveillance, we call it, and have information about that. So it would be important to um, contact the neurologist who can be in contact directly with the company and see if there's any newer information than, than what I have. So I guess there is a risk um, in theory that the genetic alteration that's being done to the patient to treat the disease may also affect the infant as well. And that infant could have too much spinal muscular atrophy. So it's the survival motor neuron protein. So that's a theoretical risk though. Uh, we don't have any, any real word published data, but there might be other data out there. I would encourage your neurologist to get in touch with the company. Excellent. And I know we're, we're going to have another session at 1 p.m. Eastern on uh, family planning, genetic counselors. And I think this uh, question will be addressed there. Um, the question is from Christina asking, what do genetic counselors do and how could they help someone affected by limb girdle muscular dystrophy prepare for pregnancy? But perhaps we can get a preview of that response, uh, Dr. Parks or Dr. O'Farrell. Sure, so I'm, I'm definitely not a, a qualified genetic counselor. Genetic counselors aren't neurologists, they're trained in genetics and they're usually not medical doctors either, although some uh, medical doctors are geneticists and they may provide counseling themselves. So definitely um, they're most useful for discussing your risk and even the, the, the amount of certainty if we have for that risk. So one of the problems with limb girdle muscular dystrophy is that even when you have a certain mutation that doesn't predict exactly what you're going to have in terms of a disease. There can be a huge spectrum from a patient who just has an elevated CK, which is a blood test, to a patient who's wheelchair bound from the very same mutation. So not only can the genetic counselors tell you the risk of passing that gene on, but they can talk to you a little bit more about the uncertainty and the manifestations of the disease. I think that's really helpful. And more than that, um, they know what the options are with respect to what choices you can make before pregnancy as well. So it's, I'm not gonna steal their whole show, so I'll, I'll let them answer that maybe a bit more specifically. That's wonderful. Um, Dr. Stephanie Plowendon is asking questions. She's asking whether there are any specific risks in congenital myopathies like nemelin rod myopathy, or if there's any information on muscle disease and twins. Yes, that's a really good question. So I guess um, what underlies the, what gene underlies the, the rod myopathy would be important. Um, um, most of the congenitals are thought to have the specific risk related to um, a small risk of uh, either malignant hyperthermia or rhabdomyolysis around the time of delivery. So that's something to, to think about. Um, and I am not aware of any patients who were twins with muscle disease that had pregnancies. That would be interesting as well, but I'm, I didn't come across any of that on my, my literature search. Thank you for the, the questions. Excellent. Um, the last uh, question or comment, rather, it's uh, they're mentioning that it's not a question, but a comment, but it's about genetic counseling. Um, the individual mentioned that herself and her husband just started their appointments after a 10 month wait. So it's very important to get on a wait list as, uh, as well as guided uh, in the seminar. So start early because they started with a full family history and they want to decipher which kind of tests uh, would be possible, what kind of blood work. So really being proactive here, as you mentioned, Dr. O'Farrell is, is uh, quite well. Yeah, uh, I'd even go for two years if you can, you know, plan ahead, plan ahead. <laughs> so if, once you start even thinking about having a, a kid, uh, really uh, start the process. Excellent. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. O'Farrell and Dr. Parks for a really evidence-informed presentation, a very clear presentation and helping to answer some, some really uh, popular questions that we also receive here at MDC through our research hotline. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available on our MDC YouTube page. And I would like to welcome everyone to go ahead and attend our two later sessions at 1 p.m. on family planning and genetics, and then later today on sex, sexuality, and neuromuscular disorder. Um, what I'd also like to do is to thank Roche, PTC, and Alexion for supporting education initiatives like this and for uh, con their continuing ongoing collaboration with MDC. Thank you all so much for your time, and I hope to see you all at the next few sessions.